Hi, this is E.T. Today's subject, the history of food supplements. Supplements to enhance athletic performance and produce hypertrophy. That's muscle growth. Now, don't confuse these supplements with androgenic hormones. I covered that subject recently. I'm talking about foods, for instance, protein, some other supplements that are found in nature and not a laboratory. One of the first that was promoted, and certainly most ubiquitous supplements, is protein, comprised of bundled amino acids, those are nitrogenous organic compounds that make up our muscles and other parts of the body. Proteins are familiar and considered very important to athletes and bodybuilders, mainly because they were and are so heavily advertised. It began during the pre-internet era in magazines. At the time, the primary, and in some cases, the only source of information for the layman. These magazines found that easily produced and inexpensive powdered proteins themselves effectively supplemented magazine sales. And so, they promoted them as necessary for athletic performance and muscle gain. So from the start, magazines devoted to physical development had a financial interest beyond any beneficial effects for their readers in promoting protein supplements, which makes suspect any real benefit of their products. Quality of these early protein supplements is very suspect. The late Terry Todd, Ph.D., the Dean of Competitive Powerlifting, was present years back at the York, Pennsylvania Barbell Company, and he witnessed CEO Bob Hoffman, a canoe paddle in hand, stir up a large cauldron full of soy flour that, when amended by a few scoops of chocolate powder, would be marketed as Hoffman's so-called laboratory-tested, high-protein, spelled with two E's. That high-protein, plus other proteins produced by other magazine publishers, would be shilled to gullible teenagers, well, such as E.T., as absolutely essential to obtain maximum strength and development. Todd explained it this way, and I'm quoting Terry Todd. The various supplements were highly profitable and had great advantage over the manufacture, packing, and shipping of heavy, less profitable barbell and dumbbell sets, unquote. So there you have it in a nutshell. It explains why so many of us way back then were suckered out of our money. The fact is, the soy protein powders sold by Hoffman, Weider, and others not necessary if you had access to wholesome food. Eggs, milk products, meat, fish, they all contain more assimilable and balanced amino acids. The only advantage to the supplements that were sold by Hoffman, Weider, and the others was convenience. You could easily swallow down a few tablespoons with liquid, even though it usually it tasted like chalk. But boiled eggs or a can of sardines would be just as easy, more nutritious, certainly less expensive. All that said, there were and are supplements that, speaking generally, do help promote overall health and strength and muscle gains. Here are a few examples. Vitamin D. D3 being the best, necessary for most Americans who on average are deficient, especially Americans who have darker skins, live in northern latitudes, or are unable to get sunshine. Another supplement is creatine, demonstrated in several studies to promote strength gains and hypertrophy. Number three, cod liver oil. Vitamin D rich and full of omega-3 oil. Wheat germ oil. 
rich in vitamin E, although the wheatgrass juice, if you've ever tried it, is more nutritious and it can cost less if you grow your grass at home. Dried beet powder, BWET, shown in several studies to, well, dramatically increase oxygen efficiency, which can lead to better workouts and a better muscle pump. Can you make any additions to this list? If so, put them in the comments section below. This is ET. Thank you for watching. Hit the like or the dislike button. Do subscribe.